It's been a little while since we tackled a Dynasty Decisions episode, but today we're going to be tackling Dynasty Decisions episode number 95. This is where you guys submit your Dynasty teams. We give you advice on trades, on rookie picks, on you know direction for your teams. All that good stuff will be covered in today's video. Today we're tackling five um, Mother Flocker members from our Flock Fantasy site. Of course, you skip the line if you do sign up over there. One Flocker member and then two of your free submissions as well. So let's not waste any time, Danny. Let's get right into it. All right, so heading into the first team, we do have from Mother Flocker, Ahmed, and he says, hey, guys, love your content. As always, you guys are the best. I'm in a situation where I'm projected the 103 as of now with my own pick, and the other one that I have is mid to late. If I don't get my hands on Marvin with my pick, I'm going to try and trade down to get as many assets as possible since I'm set as quarterback. His questions are, can I get any ideas on what I should pay for Burrow with my team if I'm trying to acquire him, and what other moves should I make to see myself up for next year to try to potentially compete and to offload points solely for this year. So looking at the team right now, you are strong at the quarterback position, obviously with Trevor Lawrence, Kyler Murray heading that group. Obviously he's shallow at running back, but like he kind of said, you're more so set up to compete next year rather than this year. So I don't mind always being in that position. Amonra, Addison, Olave, London, Nico Collins, very stacked at wide receiver. And you do have the gold standard, Kyle Pitts and David and Joku, along with Jake Ferguson. So three legit tight ends that can give you production. I mean, I'll let you take it away, but that would kind of be my answer. If you're looking for a short-term production dumps, there's a lot of tight ends that are going to be wanted in the dynasty circles with a guy like Dallas Goddard, for example, banged up. Yeah. Are we still calling Kyle Pitts the gold standard at this point in time? He's like the tight end five. He's just a tradition. It's just a tradition, tradition, but he probably is no longer the gold standard. No, I agree. Yeah. Uh, I mean, either way, like, yeah, like you have the shell of a future contender. You got two stud quarterbacks, a bunch of good wide receivers. Again, yeah, if you can sell high on potentially David Njoku, he's had a couple of good games in a row. Jake Ferguson's on a little bit of a, a hot spree right now. Same with Chuba Hubbard's, you know, just had a good game as well. Um, as far as like what you should do with your picks, like at 103, um, yeah, like if Harrison is gone, like he goes 101 or 102 and you're looking at Drake May or something like that, I would definitely try and move down to like 104, 105, maybe secure, um, you know, a player in that range, maybe a Brock Bowers or a Malik neighbors or something like that. You have the ability with all the assets that you have at wide receiver to be able to like trade for running back production if you ever needed it. Um, because between a Monroe, Addison, Alave, London, let's say you added neighbors to this team or Harrison to this team, like you're talking five wide receiver ones in dynasty. So you're looking at a very strong core at that point in time. So with this team, like you're just going to continue to build your assets until you decide you're at a point where your assets are, you know, strong enough that you could maybe make a couple moves and build out that running back core. Honestly, like the more we play dynasty, the more seasons go by, the more I'm starting to think that like before my team's actually ready to compete, I would just love to have three great quarterbacks, 10 good wide receivers, two good tight ends and be like, okay, which two of my 10 good wide receivers am I going to move off of to get running back production? Yeah, and uh, this is actually a strategy I pulled off in uh, one of the leagues I do with a couple of my buddies, but I stockpiled my wide receivers to the point where I was stacked at wide receiver. Another guy in my league was stacked at quarterback, and I needed one other quarterback with some upside. So I was able to trade off Drake London and Jordan Addison to go up and get Anthony Richardson. So those type of moves, when you stockpile a position that holds value, that holds liquidity in Dynasty, you're going to be able to get a position of need very, very easily, especially uh, if you package a couple of them together. So I really like that as well. Yeah. So as far as like what you should do to go after Joe Burrow, I mean, like, I'm not convinced that you need to go after him, but maybe if you can move off of one of Kyler Murray or Trevor Lawrence for Burrow yeah. plus, that would be the only way I would do it. But like, I mean, Kyler and, and T law right now are about equal to Burrow given the production value that they're giving. Yeah. So I would actually like from a contender who has Burrow, I would want a little plus on top of Burrow to move off of those guys. At least that's the way I look at it. Like I wouldn't move off of them one for one, even though I think I would prefer Burrow than those guys long term. He's in a one-year punt, so I actually really like that strategy of buying Burrow now, knowing you don't need the points. Again, he's trying to set himself up. I'm assuming his pick is probably the early or the mid one. He says he's 103 right now, so I'm assuming so, if he could move off of, let's say, Lawrence for Burrow straight up, then maybe it takes really your like own pick a little bit more and you end up with 102 and you can definitely secure Marvin Harrison at that point, then yeah, like maybe that's worth it. But yeah. like I said, a contender, I want to make them pay a little bit extra knowing that they need Trevor oh. Lawrence to compete. 
for sure. Again, if you can tack on like a two or something like that, or maybe right. they, they're they even willing to give you a young player on a two or something like that because they're desperate. We talked about it actually uh, in an episode over on Flock where we talked about if you're if you're not a contender buying these injured quarterbacks and if you can get like a Josh Downs type or a young, you know, exciting player. A Charbonnet because you have a weak running back yeah. or who's going to be good long term or maybe a, even a Kendra Miller and a three on top of it or something like, you know, something yeah. like that would definitely make juice. it more relevant. Yeah, just yeah. something to add to the to sweeten the pot a little bit. Uh, as far as the trades he's made, he's actually made looks like a lot of these trades in season. Um, let's yep. start with the one that he made on October fifth here. Let's go kind of like in um, ascending order. He has uh, Chris Godwin and Kyron Williams, so it looks like you know definitely selling high on Kyron Williams at the time, and he secures Drake London a twenty twenty four fourth. Obviously, Kyron has probably since moved up in value based on the week that he just had. Um, and I would assume a lot of contenders would would value him close to a late first round pick. Godwin more of like an early second round asset. But I think relatively speaking, this is a pretty decent deal because Drake London is a guy I value as like a first and a second worth of value. And that's about what you gave up here. Yeah, no, I, I like the move as well. You're getting rid of the production value as well. Inherently, it's going to make your own pick better. You're trying to get Marvin Harrison Jr. So I do think that's a, a good spot to be. Godwin, Kyron Holmes, especially, who potentially can be a top 10 running back rest of the season. Getting those production points off your team is very crucial. And like Corey kind of said, you're getting a ton of value back for Drake London. So I like that a lot. As well as this next deal, it's a little bit closer because I do think Tank Dell has really worked up the dynasty rankings. However, give me Chris Olave all day, every day. He's a top eight dynasty wide receiver for me. Yeah, I mean... Alave is definitely the more valuable asset, but yeah, like you said, Tank Dell has gotten really, really valuable in the last yeah. couple games, especially. So um, that's the tough thing there, obviously. Um, he also has he also has some optional trades listed here, so I'm assuming these are deals that are on the table right now. Um, Trevor Lawrence plus the guys first plus Nico for Jalen Hurts no. in Hollywood. I mean, you're not in a position where you can be foregoing assets like first round picks to help build up your team because you only make trades like that when you have like a stud amount of assets on your roster a bunch of extra first rounders and you're just trying to acquire a guy like yeah. Jalen Hurts so that would be the only way that I would make that move and you're not in that position so don't do that and then we kind of talked about oh if it's Lawrence you know for Burrow and uh, plus or whatever what this tells me is that the guy that has Burrow is probably also rebuilding so yeah. Trevor Lawrence plus Nico Collins for Burrow and a third like I would want like Lawrence and a third for like, I would be giving up Lawrence and a third for Burrow and Nico. Like that would be the type yeah. of package I would do. Assuming the person that has Burrow is trying to win. That's how you can kind of squeeze that out of them. Yeah. And if the guy who's who has Burrow here actually is a contender and he's trying to get this from you, you got to call him out on the, the delusion. Cause quite frankly, if that production value is valuable to you, you're going to have to pay a little bit of a premium. You have to make sure that is clear that it's concise to him. It's going to have to happen. So with a guy like T-Law, for example, he's still really young. And are we surprised at all if he finishes the year hot, the Jaguars make it to the AFC Divisional or potentially even the AFC Championship or more, and he's valued as the quarterback five this offseason? Like, I really think that there's a case scenario where Trevor Lawrence, the rest of the season, just appreciates his value. And we're talking about him right back out to where we were talking about him coming into the season. Yeah, and it, it, that might be, especially for a rebuilding team like yourself, more appealing than a 28-year-old Joe Burrow coming off of his second season-ending injury. So, um, yeah. obviously, both very valuable assets. But like I said, I would probably want Burrow plus for Lawrence, given the state of uh, the situation right now. So, um, that's probably it for this team. I mean, you're in a pretty good yeah. position. You kind of know what you're doing at this point. Um, next team that we're going to talk about is from Philip, also a mother flocker member here. Uh, he says he's two and nine to start the season, likely to finish with either the one Oh one or the one Oh two for next year. Also uh, start one IDP. So one extra spot to take care of, um, in the rookie draft that hopefully uh, will push skill players down the board. He said there's one other team in a full tank and three who have sold a lot of future picks to win now. And then he said the rest of the teams are kind of sitting in the middle. And he said, unfortunately, um, he also has a few owners who have made zero moves and won't engage in trade talks. I mean, some dynasty Classic. leagues just have people like that, which is really annoying. Uh, he said his, their trade deadline is this week. So it is, you know, coming up, obviously. Um, so he does have some offers out right now. But looking at the team, you know, 12 team, six point per passing touchdown is a one quarterback league by the looks of it. Uh, Justin Herbert is his main guy with Will Levis in reserve there. Kirk Cousins on IR. That's probably fine there. Um, Najee and a couple other, you know, Kendra Miller, J.K. Dobbins types at running back. Uh, Alave, Addison, uh, Deontay, Hollywood Brown, QJ, uh, Rashad Bateman and others at wide receiver. And then at tight end, I mean, you got Michael Mayer, but not a whole lot else there. And then at IDP, again, we're not really IDP players, but you do have three first round picks this year and an extra second round pick in 2025 as well. So again, pretty well set up, decent shell of this team, lacking a little bit of stud factor, a little bit of star power, yeah. but 
generally speaking, a, a decent shell if you can hit on your rookie picks. Yeah, 100%. I mean, you have a, a strong nucleus at the top of your wide receivers there. Alave, Addison, Deontay, Hollywood specifically is a nice little core. Uh, running back, you're weaker, which is supposed to be the case, especially if you're a 2-9 and nine team. So I like how you constructed that. And obviously, your main building block there would be a guy like Justin Herbert. So like how you set up this team, uh, you do also have a couple trades listed here, listed here which we can read off in, uh, in order. So for the first one, he was able to trade Dallas Goddard. And he was able to get back Michael Mayer in a two. And I think this is a very, very sound process move. Again, you know you're two and nine. Um, again, this happened before Dallas Goddard got hurt. So I would have said you were shedding points at that point. Obviously, that, that hasn't really materialized with Dallas Goddard being hurt. But, I mean, packaging a young, promising tight end plus a second for a 28-year-old tight end is always a sound process move. Yeah, exactly. It just makes sense given your team's situation. You were hoping for a long-term tight end option to emerge and hopefully, I mean, maybe this would have been better because you made this before the season started. So yeah. this obviously would have aged like fine wine if this was Sam Laporta that you traded for instead of Michael Mayer. Man. But I still think Michael Mayer's value has since gone up and I would prefer him Great. straight up to Dallas Goddard in Dynasty at this point in time. Um, he sold off Garrett Wilson also by the looks of it, who going into the season was projected to be potentially an elite breakout candidate, probably, uh, you know, the CD Lamb territory of wide receiver rank rankings at the end of the season, but you get Jordan Addison two late first round picks in 2024 and a 2025 second. I mean, the going rate for Garrett Wilson is probably Jordan Addison one late first round pick probably, right? Is that how much maybe the second I would say mid, I would say mid because I do think Garrett Wilson like has that superstar factor that people look at in the market. But regardless, I mean, if we're projecting that today, Jordan Addison two late ones and the second, the second, whatever it's too far out to kind of project, but the late ones this year, I mean, Assuming there's three, four first round quarterbacks, like what a guy like Romo do? League too. So like this uh, possibility. Well. I mean, it is a one quarterback league, so there's not going to be those quarterbacks. Um, but it is an IDP league, which could push those players down the board. I, I would have Fair. to think too, even in a one quarterback league, Caleb Williams and Drake may have a chance to slide ahead of some of the players that you're going to get in the late first round uh, area there. But regardless, I mean, you're talking about you know at the very least Romo Dunze, Troy Franklin, Xavier yeah. Worthy, maybe RB two, maybe on Henderson. Or, yeah, like in this yeah. classic, I think you're going to get some decent assets with that pick yeah. um, pick combination there, and then uh, his. Uh, trade that he made on October 13th here, he has listed, he sold Chris Godwin, Ramondre Stevenson, sure. Roshan Johnson, a third round pick. Again, he's selling off those productive assets that aren't really worth a whole lot in the long term. And you get one stud in Chris Olave, a guy that you can build around because prior to that, it looks like your team is pretty mid across the board without Chris Olave. You didn't really have a lot of stud factor. And then JK Dobbins, kind of a worthy dart throw. We know he's talented. It's, he's injury prone, obviously, but yeah. he is at least an upside swing. Yeah, I mean, like, even if he doesn't materialize anything, even if you equated this to the fourth, let's just, like, the fourth versus the 2025 third, you would rather the third, but they're inconsequential to the big goal here. The big meat and potatoes of this deal is Godwin, Stevenson, and Roshan for Chris Olave. And Chris Olave, like, like I kind of mentioned, we similar to a guy like Garrett Wilson, similar to some of those young wide receivers where they flashed elite superstar talent, and the only thing uh, keeping them from unlocking that at this point is the quarterback and is the situation. Yeah, and I mean, Derek Carr's probably going to be around longer. He yeah, just performs better or they like upgrade the offensive too. line or whatever. Like they've had they've had some unluckiness. And again, we're, we're betting on the long term with Chris Olave, especially given your team. So even if it's next year, he still has Derek Carr. Maybe two years from now, he has a big quarterback upgrade in a 2025 draft or in a free agent pickup or whatever the case even is. Even just so, better coaching too, to be honest. Like, yeah, fucking <laughs> Dennis Allen and Pete Carmichael, I know, have yeah. not been really good. So, um, I mean, overall, when you look at this team, like I said, definitely lacking some star power. Hopefully you do get your hands on you know, ideally 101 this year for Marvin Harrison Jr., but even 102 Malik Neighbors would probably be a great addition to this team as well. Yeah. In no, a one quarterback league. Absolutely. So I think we can move on to uh, Anthony's team. Again, also another mother flocker here. It's a 12 team PPR, four point per passing touchdown, tight end premium super flex league. So you could see the team there CJ Stroud, Kyler Murray, Sam Howell, Josh Dobbs, a couple other quarterbacks that have some relevance there. So strong at that position Jonathan Taylor, Zach Sharbs, uh, Jerome Ford, et cetera, at running back. Garrett Wilson, T. Higgins, Drake, London, Jordan Addison, JSN, Jamison Williams, Josh Downs at wide receiver. And then uh, Mark Andrews as his main tight end with Tucker Craft and a couple other upside pieces there. Looks like he has all of his own picks plus an additional second this year and not his own third. Um, and then he has somebody else's first that's not actually his own. It is projected to be early. Um, but overall, I mean, this is a pretty strong team. He gave us a ton of context so we can go through some of his questions here. Um, like he said, uh, for example, the pick that he has could be the 101, or at the very least, it's a it's a top three pick. 
Um, he traded away his own first, but he's trying to get it back right now. He has a deal potentially on the table right now. He is six and five. He's in sixth place, and he's thinking about trading Sam Howell away for his own 2024 first. So, I mean, we could just tackle that yeah. conversation right off the bat. Yeah, that's an absolute smash. If Sam Howell is able to get you a first, which you can then turn back into an early first round pick, that's a smash. Even if it was a mid to late projected first round pick, well, it, it would be a mid first as of now because it's his yeah. own first in sixth place. But I mean, Correct. if you're gonna you have the control of production it. from your team and you know try and lose out or something like that, it could potentially become like the 105, 106. Yeah, one hundred percent. So I mean, even if it was a mid to late first. I love the Sam Howell uh, talent. I think he's a, a good fantasy football player. Do I think he's the long-term answer in Washington? That is the question. That's why he's more so a top 20 dynasty quarterback rather than if we knew he had the job security, you can make the argument given how many times he throws the ball, he could be a top 12 dynasty quarterback. But given what we know now, given that there's still some pause in terms of exactly what we could expect from that long-term situation, like Washington's a four and eight team. What if they fall in love with one of the quarterbacks in the cycle? You never really know. I'm a little bit concerned about Sam Howell. So getting any type of first round liquidity for him right now, I'd be taking. Yeah, absolutely. And it looks like, I mean, he's got a Texans fan. That's a huge, you know, Stroud guy, as I would be if I was a Texans yeah. fan right now. Yeah. Um, he actually super chatted us a couple days ago, apparently. And he said, should I trade Stroud and the potential 101 to 103, that pick that he has for Justin Herbert plus more? And I think we said, no, we're like, no, Justin Herbert and Stroud are basically equivalent value. You don't want to yeah. give up a highly value, uh, valuable pick like that. Um, his latest offer, apparently, which uh, apparently he declined, is Herbert, his 2024 and 2025 seconds, which are both projected to be late. Donald Parham, who's worth nothing for CJ Stroud, Josh Dobbs, Trey Lance and his second. Again, it, yeah. it's just not enough value like Herbert yeah. and Stroud. If you want Stroud, you should just swap him Herbert straight like that's what it yeah. should be. Yeah, 100 well, percent. I mean, Stroud and Herbert, you can make the case that you would rather Stroud in Dynasty because he's a couple years younger and because we know he's going to be amongst the elite quarterbacks in the NFL. And uh, for the majority of time, when people say something like that, you would be like, wow, that's a hot take. Like Justin Herbert, in my opinion, is probably a top four talent at the position. But CJ Stroud is showing this in his rookie season where his team around him, his supporting cast, is probably going to be the weakest it's going to be the majority of that rookie it's also contract. young in comparison to, I mean. uh, to Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. And obviously QJ looks like a bust right now. Like Justin Herbert has supporting cast question marks and CJ Stroud had them coming into the year, but he doesn't anymore because, you know, Tank Dell and Nico Collins, all these young players have actually developed around CJ Stroud and they still have assets to be able to add more to it. So fun fact, uh, they've both played 11 games this year and Justin Herbert has three more points scored on the season. And CJ Stroud is three years younger. So you could realistically make the case you would rather have Stroud over Herbert rest of, uh, for in Dynasty. Yeah. So if this guy's a Texans fan, like the absolute lowest I would sell him to CJ Stroud for is Justin Herbert and a second for CJ Stroud and a third or something like that. Like that's that's the absolute minimum like I want. Like he him giving you Parham and like a bunch of useless assets, like who gives a shit? Like if he wants CJ Stroud, he's got to give you Herbert and nothing else but like good, valuable picks. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would just hold in that regard. Uh, he said this guy is in second place and he just lost Burrow. Is this worth it or what What else should I counter with? Honestly, I mean, see if you can potentially move Kyler for Burrow. Like, I, I would rather do that because, I mean, realistically, like CJ Stroud, unless he's willing to overpay for CJ Stroud, like unless he's get, giving you as, as crazy as this sounds, because he's desperate with Burrow, would he give you Burrow in a first for Stroud in a second? Because maybe in yeah, that like case, yeah, yeah, maybe you can that. maybe you can take the fact that he's a Texas fan and wants CJ Stroud, and the fact that he's desperate without Joe Burrow, and you know, because I would not sell like full disclosure. Like I think Burrow and Stroud, given your team situation, the fact that you're rebuilding, I would exactly. rather just hold Stroud to be honest. Agreed. So if you can get like Danny said, like Burrow in a late first for Stroud and uh, and a second or something like that, that's the type of deal that I would probably do. Knowing that, like I mean, your second is going to be early and his first is going to be late. So if he needs some convincing, then you could convince him on that. But for the most part, like I don't think you need to sell Stroud to this Agreed. guy unless he's going to actually pay up for him. No, I completely agree there. Uh, he also says listed here that the guy traded Swift who is in fourth place with a pretty solid team, although he did lose uh, Kirk Cousins for the year. He's willing to give up his 2025 second and his 2026 third for Josh Dobbs after I told him there's a bidding war. Is it worth it? Now, unfortunately for you, after Monday Night Football, it'd probably be tough to get a second and a third for Josh Dobbs at this point, but that offer is still on the table and he's still willing to do it. Like you smash it. I'm not even convinced it's a certainty that Josh Dobbs is going to start after the bye. Yeah, no, they could want to see what they 
have out of Jared Hall. Hall or whatever if they wanted to. So, yeah, yeah, if you can get a two and a three for Josh Dobbs, absolutely do that. Any, and that goes now, for, I mean, Jerome Ford is also a guy that sticks out yep. to me on your team that I would potentially try and sell just given that he's a short term asset. And even though he's young, like Nick Chubb will be back next year and all that kind of stuff. So Jerome Ford, if you can get a second rounder for him, he would probably be off my roster as well. And I think, I mean, going into next year, you should be able to retool this. I don't want to go over super in depth, all of his uh, trades that he made in the off season, but he literally netted positive in all of them. Like, I mean, Easily. Swift and Bateman for CJ Shroud in a second is a fucking fleece and a half. Um, Kincaid, Kincaid in a third, one, maybe. Kincaid's been good. Um, I mean, you got a 2024 first out of it, which again, looks like a first that's going to be early. And then Isaiah Pacheco, the 204, which became Roshan and Chase Claypool for you. It looks like you traded up for Jordan Addison, which was smart. And then you traded down from Roshan to Josh Downs. So I heard Josh Downs going wow. into rookie grass. Definitely a great move. So, I mean, it looks like you've made a bunch of great moves. I have faith that you're going to continue doing so. So we could probably yeah. uh, move on to the next team here, which is from uh, Brock D., uh, 12 team PPR best ball league, six point per passing touchdown with a half tight end premium and a super flex format. Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, Bryce Young, one of the like best type of quarterback cores to have because Bryce Young is going to have some time to develop. You have those two studs already. Charbonnet, Roshan, some upside at running back. Jahan Dotson, QJ, Marvin Mims, Mingo. So a couple misses here at wide receiver so far, but um, still some youth there. And then Dalton Kincaid, Kyle Pitts at tight end. Looks like he has uh, two first round picks, including an early one, which is probably his, I would imagine, uh, in 2024, and then an extra third uh, and an extra second in 2025. So again, another like similarly built team, a shell with some young wide receivers, but definitely lacking some studs, at least that wide receiver, but the quarterback core is definitely set. Yeah, no, 100%. He does say here that my biggest flaw is that I stayed away from production during the draft, and now I'm struggling to move anyone for picks, resulting in me selling low. Though that's just the league market. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is you'll see, and this is a common thing that I'll hear even sometimes uh, to people just messaging me is like, why is my league market so low? And it's like, that's because your league market is sharp. Like sometimes you go on Twitter and you see, oh, I sold, let's just say earlier in the year before Nick Chubb got hurt, I sold him for two firsts. And it's like, yeah, I wish I could get that for Nick Chubb, obviously. But at the end of the day, when you're in sharper leagues, people start realizing, okay, these picks are gold. I got to make sure if I am selling a pick, I'm getting the proper production value. So I just think you're probably more so in a sharp market rather than people not wanting to buy your players. Uh, he does also say that his pick is currently the 102, which is going to be huge because you you already have a really, really good quarterback core. If you want to take a, a little bit of a you know bidding war for Drake May, Caleb Williams, Marvin Harrison, I think you could do that. Or I mean, you could just take Marvin Harrison too. I would just take Marvin core. probably. Yeah, that would, that would work too. I didn't even see the receiver core. Yeah, and I mean his league also could be sharp in other ways too. Because I mean, there's one thing when your team when your league is sharp from production pieces, and they don't want to give you too much for that. There's another thing when people are recognizing face planners like Quentin Johnson, you can't even sell him uh, at this point in time because that's probably the league market that you're looking at. And you know, QJ and Mingo and Mims, like they're trending towards that direction. And yeah. unfortunately, I mean, if you had just drafted different players in your rookie draft, you could have you know Zay Flowers, Josh Downs, Jaden Reed instead of those guys, and your team would look a lot better right now. But I mean, sometimes you just you just get unlucky with unlucky. the picks that you had and uh, definitely don't love that for you. But I mean, your team is still in a relatively decent position. Uh, some of the trades that it looks like he made here uh, early in the season, he sold Nico Collins off of a good week for a late first. I mean, uh, Nico Collins in an early third for a late first. I think that's relatively speaking, decent value for Nico Collins. But knowing that he's been continuing to get better and better and now he's attached to CJ Stroud, you might yeah. have actually get a little bit more for him. Um, I yeah. don't know what you're on that one. No, I like the process of what, why you made it at the time. He had a couple good weeks. You didn't really know if it was here to stay. We didn't know if CJ Stroud was completely legit at that point. So you wanted to liquidate, get a first, knowing that you're not going to compete. I think that's a sharp process. Again, sometimes it's not fully going to work out. But if it works out 80, 85% of the time, you will take that in the long term. So with Nico Collins, obviously, he's appreciated his value, probably past the value that you got from him in this deal. But what if it was a flash? He, you know, ends up being a wide receiver for rest of the season and you miss out on the opportunity to liquidate for a first. So I love the, and the first, by the way, not going down in value anytime Absolutely soon, not. given how the strength of this class yeah. and just the general, you know, life cycle we see of rookie picks in general, like this pick is probably going to be at least as valuable as Nico Collins. No. And I mean, if you look at my dynasty trade history, like I will have some deals that I lost a big amount to, but at the end of the day, if you trust your process and you stick to your process, you will be successful. You will be profitable in the long term. So although again, like on surface level, you might say Nico Collins is probably worth the first on his own right now. So you overpaid by a three. 
it's not that big uh, a consequential type of move at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, selling A.J. Dillon and Desmond Ritter for two-thirds, I mean, that's probably fine. Yeah. I would have hoped maybe for a second, but at the same time, it's like, whatever. Yeah. Who gives a shit? And then you sold uh, Jalen Warren and Brandon Cooks. Again, Jalen Warren, probably worth about a second on his own right now. So yeah. maybe, again, you lost this deal. But I think process-wise, again, like... Also shed points. We're, again, yeah. you shed some points off your team. You get yourself a second-round pick. Yeah. I, it's not a big deal. It, it's yeah. you got, You're never going to go broke buying draft picks, is essentially what, what the case is here. I mean, you turned some players that would worsen your pick, again, in a position, like you said, where you're trying to get the 102, 101 in your draft. You saw some players that would worsen your pick with the production, and you were able to still get a first, a second, and two thirds. So I do think that's a good process regardless. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, you still have some work to do, obviously, adding Marvin or whoever you add to this team. You're going to need some wide receiver help. You're probably going to need a running, uh, like some running back help as well. You're probably two years away with this team because even yeah. let's say you drafted Marvin Harrison and need Emeka to stop or something like that, your, your running back core isn't going to be up to snuff. Your tight end core is up to snuff. Your quarterback core is up to snuff. Your wide receiver core will be on its way, but you're still going to have some work to do. So continue to sell some productive assets if you can. Maybe see what you can get in like a, a buy low scenario for a young core quarterback as well. Maybe you can sell off on Kyler Murray for, you know, somebody that's having like a down stretch, like Anthony Richardson, for example, maybe you can sell Kyler Murray for Anthony Richardson and a future first, like a 2025 first or something like that. I mean, yeah, like, or like a Josh Downs type, you get the stack. Like uh, I would also, like you said, really like the liquidity. Also some context on the late first from the Nico Collins deal. He does say it has a chance to be mid because the guy lost Burrow. If that ends up being a mid first and you get the 106, and everything we just said goes to move. That trade at all then. Yeah, everything we just said goes to moot because, I mean, those the top six in this class, assuming even a, a third quarterback goes high, like you're guaranteed a first-round quarterback, one of the best tight end prospects we've ever seen, one of the two better, or I mean, Marvin Harrison, the best receiver prospect, but also Malik Neighbors in his own right as well. Like the top of the, the top six could be absolutely juiced up, assuming a third quarterback is drafted in the first round. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you're in a pretty good position to to help rebuild this thing, but you, you still need to, uh, collect some assets and, and yeah. collect some studs as well, which sometimes puts you in a difficult position, but I, I trust your abilities, kind of what your process has shown so far. So um, Brody is the next team that we're going to talk about. His is the last mother flocker team that we're going to talk about. He's curious kind of like how we would categorize his team. So he doesn't know if he's a rebuilder, contender, house money type of situation. Looks like um, in terms of what type of team it is, it's a 10 team PPR uh, lineup format. So not a best ball, four point per passing touchdown, super so flex funny. league. So having uh, Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow, Kyler Murray, Will Levis, and Josh Dobbs absolutely loaded at quarterback. Jameer Gibbs, Miles Sanders, James Conner, Kendra Miller, et cetera, at running back with Devin Singletary there as well. Jamar Chase, Zay Flowers, Terry McLaurin, Nico Collins, Traylon Burks, <laughs> Quinton Dropston he has listed here. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Dalton Kincaid, Greg Dolchich, and George Kittle. So, I mean, this is kind of difficult. I mean, when you say, like, how would you categorize this team? I would say this is a team stuck in limbo with just at least the direction of it. But I would say the shell of this team could be a future really solid, like, one-year punt. That's the way I look at this. Yeah, I love how you structured the, this team. You do have a – I mean, you have three guys. Uh, Greg Dolchich obviously falling off this year because of the hamstring issues. But I still think, like, next year, assuming he's healthy, he's he'll be able to He's a perfect tight end, too, for rebuilders right now because yeah, he could sure. very much appreciate in value. But, like, I mean, the way I look at this team is that – he says this is second ever dynasty league. They did the the startup last year. Quarterbacks were undervalued in the draft. So again, it might be tough to sell on guys like Lamar Jackson, Joe yeah. Burrow, Kyler Murray. The fact that you got Kyler Murray at the four, three Dak, Dak Prescott at the six, three, who you later traded for Joe Burrow, who I'm assuming, you know, this Probably was recent because Joe Burrow has, you know, been injured in and, September. Uh, so I, I have no fucking idea how you ended up doing this trade, but regardless, I mean, looking at this team, you still have some work to do. I would probably try and sell on a quarterback, if not multiple. And then also like George Kittle is an aging asset, you know, Terry McLaurin, a little bit of an aging asset, James Conner, an aging asset, Devin Singletary kind of relevant right now. Those are the types of guys that I would maybe try and punt off of. I'm trying to wrap my head around the Dak Burrow trade, to be honest, because the timing of it doesn't make sense. If you had said this happened recently, like after Joe Burrow got hurt, I would have understood it. But the fact that this happened in mid-September, like Dak didn't start being a fantasy needle mover till October. So I don't know what the, like, what was this guy like seeing? I mean, kudos to him. He, he, he foresaw that Dak would get a, a value and, you know, CeeDee Lamb, they could potentially move him over the top in a win-now type of situation. But two seconds to move from the Dak-Lamb stack to the Burrow Chase stack, like, from an age perspective alone is a sharp move. But then you factor in that, as much as I love Dak and Lamb, like, you're still taking Burrow and Chase stack every day. 
Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, this is a really difficult spot to be in because I mean, he says like, I'm in third place, like I'm seven and four and I like, I could win now, theoretically. The way I look at this team is I'm like, there's got to be two or three better teams in your league. Like Jamar Chase lost Joe Burrow. It's Jer the Burrow, running backs mostly. On your, on your team is not going to help. It's a 10 team league as well. So like everybody's team should be better. Jameer Gibbs is really your only needle moving running back. Yeah. James Conner and those guys like they can contribute, but not really. What I would do is he says, I wanted to make this a house money team. It's not currently right now. It's kind of like a, a fraudulent contender at the moment. What I would do is take your contending assets and turn it into a house money team. Yeah. And you could still potentially, because you're seven and four, get lucky and maybe make the championship and, you know, win your buy-in back or whatever the case is, like how your payout structure works. For me, I would try and sell George Kittle. I would try and sell Terry McLaurin. I would try and sell one of your quarterbacks, maybe Lamar, maybe Kyler, maybe Levis, who like Josh Dobbs, whoever, um, and then maybe sell off when you're aging running backs as well and then try and reboot this thing next year yeah no i agree uh it's just funny looking at that quarterback value uh, he says 16 seconds playoffs I, I agree with your analysis though this is a house money team next year should be your peak not to mention that early first round pick that you have i don't know how you got it given the the nucleus that you have on this team but you had an early first round valuation to the squad i mean you can be a monster very very soon uh i'm assuming because it's a a, a 10 team start eight like the guy that you want there is going to be Marvin Harrison Jr. Yeah. Assuming that's a 102, the 103, because you're set at quarterback. And you could, uh, although you have a lot of really good numbers of receiver, you add Marvin Harrison next to Jamar Chase. And then you can, like, for example, a Nico Collins, a Terry McLaurin type, you can spare off to try to get better at the running back position. You should go and compete for 2024 because I do think that you will be in a position to do so. Yeah. And the nice thing too is, I mean, you said this is a second ever dynasty league and they did the startup this year. So hopefully people realize after this season, like somebody with like a great quarterback core, like wins the league or something like that. And they realize shit, like my quarterbacks are Geno Smith and Jared Goff or something. Yeah. I need to go get better quarterbacks because you're the guy that has the the goods that you monopolize the market. Baby. Plus you also have the potential one one to one Oh three that you could maybe sell off on. If you don't want to take Harrison or maybe you're at a position where Harrison's not going to be there or something like that. So yeah, like you're in a position where you have a good team, you have, a lot of good assets you just kind of need to sell off some of your competitive pieces so for me the answer to your main question is i'm seven and four what do i do is i would sell your competitive assets because you're probably not going to win amen i agree uh we can move on to the sixth team and that's going to be the first flocker of the video with sir king jared and he says hey boys this was a help money team that i had a week one trade push me into attempting to compete he's currently trying to win but would love to keep that liquidity for next year's draft his current plan is to look for any team's planning to sell off a competing quarterback guys like brock purdy you know geno smith matthew stafford for the cheap and a couple of his questions that he has here is He's not sure if we have any other suggestions or would we just try to discourage him from selling off some future assets? He's in seven, he's seven, five, he's in fourth place. It's very likely that he makes the playoffs because no team is very dominant. So, I mean, we can look at it right now. Um, I mean, just seeing it right off the bat, the fact that you have two uh, mid first round picks and one early first, there's no way I'm selling those picks. There's no, no way yeah, I'm selling yeah, those I. picks. Absolutely not. I mean, you have Justin Herbert at quarterback, but you have a lot of, uncertainty ambiguity after that trading for a Jared Goff type unless it's like let's just say Kenny Pickett in the mid second and you get Goff and you want to see if you can potentially house money at this year try to get lucky that's one thing but if you're selling off a first round pick I'm not doing that yeah, I mean, Kenny Pickett is a guy that maybe is more intriguing on the open market right now because of the Matt Canada firing, yeah. the offense looked better. Maybe this is the perfect week to go after a, a Jared Goff type or maybe even like a Brock Purdy type using Kenny yeah. Pickett and seeing how you can do that. But as of now, I think like house money is your you know your proper, you know, designation yeah. of this team because you know you got Bijan robinson you got some you know aging running backs aaron jones david montgomery types i think the right call here is probably to try and win but i'm not going to sell my liquidity to go out of my way and do it unless i'm buying an absolute superstar like maybe kenny pickett in a mid one gets you a stud quarterback then fine yeah go ahead and do that but at the same time i don't want to like forego all of the liquidity i've built up just to try and compete like don't sell a mid first and you know your 2025 first for like christian mccaffrey or something like that like as much as that would really help your team i probably would rather um let this team develop into a future dynasty yeah i completely agree you also have a couple trades listed here we can uh kind of rattle off a little bit in order week one week six and week nine. First one you're able to do you trade away gus edwards calvin really and Jawan johnson for cooper cup and travis kelsey even though you're not in a pure like win now type of window 
I really like this move, to be honest, because this feels like you bought Cooper Cup once he was dealing with that injury. People didn't really know what he was looking like. And I mean, the fact that you got Travis Kelsey as a plus, this is basically Cooper Cup plus for Calvin Ridley. And I have Cooper Cup ranked above Calvin Ridley. Yeah, I mean, he has in his uh, team listed, he has listed Calvin Ridley still there. So I'm assuming that's just a mistype and, and Ridley's no yeah. longer on his team. But yeah, I mean, I think that's a pretty solid move. I wasn't the huge Cooper Cup guy coming into the season, but in week one, like I probably definitely would have made this trade. And then uh, 2024 mid second and a late third in week six, he sold for Aaron Jones, which mm. again, not really a great, well-advised move. I think you're sacrificing a little too much of your liquidity for win now running backs. And yes, as you guys have heard me talk about before, if I'm going to buy um, win now running backs to help me like compete. I like to buy ETN, Ramondre Stevenson, Kenneth Walker, guys that are like they're win now running backs, but they're at least going to be relevant like two to three years from now. They're not going if, to be completely irrelevant pretty soon, like Aaron Jones and potentially Cooper Cup and Travis Kelsey are going to be. To be to be fair, I actually I like buying cheap points. To be honest, I just don't think this is cheap enough. Like if you had bought Raheem Mostert for this instead, or even like you might've gotten Mostert for less than this. The problem is maybe Mostert was on like a competitive team or something like that. But regardless, I think buying low on old assets is not something I like doing in dynasty. And I think that's what you did with cup and with Aaron Jones. And I would say as of now, it hasn't really aged, you know, properly yet. Well, the Cooper cup one, I still think is aged well, because you got, well, I mean, you got Kelsey. So that, that helps. Exactly. You got enough, got it for a cheap enough price. I don't mind the process of making this Jones deal if you're a top contender. And that's kind of what I outlined when we talked through it uh, tra- in season trading over on Flock Fantasy, where y- if you're a top contender and you need to go buy cheap points, I'm fine sacrificing some liquidity. When you're more so a house money team and doing it, that's where you start getting into some problems. Yeah, and I mean, the last trade in week nine, Jaden Reed, Marvin Mims in a mid-second for Mike Evans and David Montgomery. This one aged a lot better. Maybe it's just yeah. simply the players are performing better, 100%. which is probably true. It's hindsight um, bias. Yeah, it is hindsight bias. Because if Aaron Jones had came back from his hamstring injury and you know, been nine right now, he won, I wouldn't have been saying that that was a bad trade. But at least, yeah. you know, the Mike Evans, David Montgomery trade kind of made up for what happened in the other two trades where the guys were like dealing with injuries and stuff like that. But I mean, overall, you've made some good moves considering that you were a house money team and you haven't really sacrificed a ton of liquidity. Like all you've sold is like, what, two seconds and a third and some other like young assets that aren't going to be like superstars like Jane Reed and Marvin Mims. And you know, those guys, they're good players, but I don't think I'm, I'm overly worried that they're going to burn me in the long term. So I think we can move on to the next team here. The uh, last two submissions were free submissions for you guys there. So uh, Austin C uh, lists his team. You guys can see it on the screen. It's a 12 team half PPR four point per passing touchdown, super flex. He's got Lamar Jackson to a uh, Bryce young, Kirk cousins, running backs, Deandre Swift, David Montgomery, Tony Pollard, Ramondre Stevenson, uh, HN kind of buried down there as well. AJ Brown, Ayuk, DK Metcalf, Zay Flowers, T Higgins, Calvin Ridley, Sam Laporta is his main tight end. So a very competitive team with some good pick equity as well. He has listed as he is an early 2024 first. It's probably not his own, I would assume. Um, yeah. But yeah, very good team. So far, a lot of the teams have been pretty similar in this video so far. This one looks to be a contender with picks in the bank, which is obviously the best place to be in in Dynasty. Yeah, amen. I mean, Lamar Jackson, Tua, Bryce Young, Kirk Cousins at quarterback. Uh, you got a lot of win now type of running backs that can help you out for a contending team. AJ Brown, Brandon Ayuk, DK Metcalf, Sam Laporta. Like this team should be one of the top teams in your league in terms of potentially getting the you know championship bid. So I really like what you're able to do here. The first is looking like pick three or four. So imagine adding if this ends up being pick three. Imagine adding like a Drake May or a Marvin Harrison Jr. type asset to the squad. I, I think you've smashed it out of the park. Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to poke any holes in this team, if I'm being 100% honest with you. Like, I Austin, love that you submitted this team, but like, realistically, there's nothing you really need to or have to do to make this team even better. He said, trade deadline's over, so we can't make any more moves for the rest of the year. He says, any package deals or anything that you'd be looking towards in the offseason, I would say, I mean... Looking at your team, like maybe selling off on like DeAndre DK Swift Metcalf. if he's a free agent. He might not re-sign with the Eagles or something like that. David Montgomery's a little bit older. You know, Ramondre Stevenson, there's a risk that they could maybe add something to his backfield or something like that. But for the most part, man, like we're, we're poking holes. DK Metcalf is a guy that maybe stands out as somebody that you'd want to upgrade from. Maybe you can take DK Metcalf and your early 2024 second or your mid 2024 second and go after somebody better. Maybe like a Chris Olave or um, maybe Garrett Wilson. Like the Jets are a complete dumpster fire for the rest of the year. I wouldn't be shocked if people are selling low on a guy like Garrett Wilson or something like that as well. So, I mean, again, we're, we're really picking at straws at this point in time. Like yeah. you, you have a really solid team. 
Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, this is a loaded team. Uh, just stay fluid, just stay flexible. Obviously, when you have an opportunity to buy a, a studly player for a non-studly price, you should be able to go do it. Yeah, and he says, like, obviously, it's way too early to tell what to do in the rookie draft. But again, if you have the 103 or the 104, Marvin Harrison or Malik Neighbors would make this team a lot better. Drake May would make this team a lot better as well. So those would be the main targets I'd have for that first round pick. And then as far as the sec the early second and the mid second, that's going to probably be the territory where you can take a dart throw on like a Troy Franklin or an Xavier Worthy with that early second. And then in the mid second, maybe a Blake Corum or a Raheem Sanders or a Trey Benson or something is the type of guy you go after. Or maybe you go after Jatavion Sanders too, because you just it looks like you just have Sam Laporta at tight end and there's no other guys listed there. Yeah, 100%. But uh, either way, you seem like you got a good head on your shoulders. Just keep plugging away. Uh, I think we move on to the next team and the final team of the video, and that's going to be from Max S. He says here, for context of the league, shallow league with nine starters and 11 bench spots. We dropped five people after the Super Bowl and rookie draft was in late August. Who should I try and target as a tight end and other positions to make a championship run? He's in third place with the third most points for. So I'll let you break down the team and uh, and potentially what direction we could be going with it. Yeah, I mean, in a two-quarterback league, so it's not even a super flex, a two-quarterback, 10-team league, Justin Herbert, Sam Howell, Ryan Tannehill, a little light at the quarterback position, but, I mean, yeah. Saquon, Bijan, Raheem Mostert, A-Chan, like, the, the running back core is clearly built to win now. Christian Kirk, Zay Flowers, Garrett Wilson, Nico Collins, and those guys, again, I'd, I'd like to be a little bit stronger at wide receiver as a contender. And then Darren yeah. Waller, Taysom Hill, also not the strongest at that position. So, yeah. I mean, he says he's in third place with the third most points for, and a lot of your assets are of the aging variety. So you probably need to try and make a championship push this year. But as soon as this season is over, like I would maybe leverage some of these assets, Saquon Barkley, Raheem Mostert, uh, Darren Waller, um, you know, some of these players that are older and see if I can maybe punt next year um, and, and be better off in 2025. So ideally maybe you can win the championship this season and then sell off some of your aging assets, try and rebuild in 2024. And then in 2025, try and run it back again. So, I mean, you have some great assets, you have some guys that you can build around, but at the same time, it's a little flimsy and you'd probably need to get lucky to win this year. Yeah, structurally, I'm not going to lie. I'm not the biggest fan of the team being weak at quarterback. Uh, Sam Howell obviously producing a ton of fantasy points. Like, I see why you, you are in third place with the third most points. Sam Howell obviously being a very good fantasy player this year. Guys like Raheem Moster, uh, Najee Harris has turned it around these last couple of weeks. But at the end of the day, I don't think structurally you are strong enough built for the long term. So like Corey kind of said, after the season, you try to compete again. You're kind of in a spot where you have to. But then I would kind of look, uh, be looking towards a mini retool, to be honest, because I do think people would still be high on Sam Howell, young quarterback. Ideally, if you can sell him off prior to the NFL draft, that's something I would be willing to do. Uh, guys like Raheem Moser coming off a high, but he saw a 32-year-old injury-prone running back that I tried to get off. If you can get a second type of value for him, I would be looking to do that after the year. Um, and in general, like guys like that, I'd say, are my biggest goal, especially Najee Harris, too. He's coming off a high. If he finishes the season strong, if people try to you know buy back into him, he's still one of the most inefficient running backs we've seen in the NFL over his uh, tenure in Pittsburgh. Yeah, so like the type of deal I would be looking to make, for example, would be like Sam Howell and Saquon Barkley for Anthony Richardson and Drake London. And if you're in a more casual yeah. league, you're going to be able to get deals like that done. Like that type of that that deal that I just mentioned, that would get auto declined in the leagues that Easily. me and Danny are in. But I would say ten team league where it's you know you drop five players, your rookie draft is in August. It doesn't sound like a very sharp league, if I'm being honest. So I would say that you're probably going to be able to get away with some good deals for productive assets, which makes me want to sell production even more. And if people are not willing to buy into these players in the off season, then you might have to make a decision before the season is over. Even though you're in third place and you have the third most points for, there's a couple teams in your league that you're just flat out not going to beat in the fantasy championship or the fantasy playoffs. Maybe you make that decision now if you haven't had your trade deadline. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Okay, so that is the end of the video. Again, if you guys want to make sure that you're on future episodes of Dynasty Decisions, the best way to get your team reviewed is to go over to flockfantasy.com. Use the promo code FSE. You do have to use our promo code to get first priority on Dynasty Decisions and sign up for you know a monthly flocker, a monthly mother flocker, or better yet, sign up annually and save six months. Get a free Zoom consultation with myself or with Danny, and we can go over your Dynasty Decisions um, in person, basically, and talk with you, and you can ask us questions on the spot. That is the best way you can get that you can also use our dynasty rankings manifesto our trade value chart the new uh, trade calculator all that good stuff is available on flock plus you'll get access to all of your favorite dynasty and redraft fantasy football content creators content for free by signing up with our promo code there as well so if that interests you check that down below in the pinned comment but with that being said peace out and we'll talk to you soon